Thank you all for joining the ECB in Focus webinar series. Um, I'm uh, Luke Laffen, the Director of Research here at the ECB, and today our speaker is Stuart Russell, who is a Professor of Computer Science at UC Berkeley. He's originally from the UK, where he studied physics before he moved to the United States in the early 80s, where he completed his PhD in Computer Science. He has made seminal contributions to the field of artificial intelligence, such as new methods for inverse reinforcement learning that allow to infer people's objectives, values, or rewards by observing their behavior. And his textbook, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, is the most widely used textbook on artificial intelligence worldwide. And when reading it, I was very pleased to see several chapters uh, summarizing the field of microeconomic theory, me being an economist. Um, we can argue about that later, whether that's economics or artificial intelligence. So today, Stuart will talk to us about AI concepts, trends and coexistence. This is a hugely important and timely topic for us at the ECB, as we are in the process of developing our AI strategy. Stuart is the ideal speaker on the topic, having been at the heart of the field of AI over the past four decades. He is deeply aware of both the opportunities as well as the risks that AI offers. He has been an advocate of fostering so-called human-compatible artificial intelligence, whereby artificial intelligence respects human values. The format of today's one-hour webinar is as follows. Professor Russell will give a presentation for about 40 minutes, followed by Q&A. I will lead the Q&A by collecting your questions via the chat function. And now, Stuart, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, unfortunately, I can't manage my presentation myself. Uh, due to some problem with teams. So uh, I think Anna is going to uh, help me. So let's look at the next slide. Um, and uh, so I'm going to very briefly cover some of the prehistory and history of AI. Um, actually, these are slides from uh, the opening lecture of my undergraduate course uh, and the, taking material from the textbook that Luke mentioned. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about uh, what happens if uh, the field of AI succeeds in its long-term goal, which is to create machines that are more intelligent than human beings. Um, and uh, we'll see that that doesn't necessarily go well. Uh, and the last part, we'll briefly talk about how we might uh, make sure that it does go well by building AI systems that we can be sure uh, will be safe and beneficial to human beings. Okay, next. Um, so everyone thinks that AI is a very recent field, but it's just a, in some sense, it's a renaming of something that we've been trying to do for thousands of years, which is to understand how our own minds operate um, and to do so in a way that um, can uh, predict and analyze and perhaps uh, reproduce. Um, so, for example, uh, if you want to understand how reasoning works, um, this is something that philosophers have studied uh, uh, since at least the um, ancient Greeks formalized uh, logic back in around uh, four, four to five hundred years uh, BC, and um, they also uh, thought about planning, for example. So uh, Aristotle very clearly describes uh, what we would now call a goal regression planning algorithm, um, where you start from the goal and you work backwards through possible actions until uh, until you get to something that's true in uh, in the present, and then you run, run those actions forward to achieve a goal. Um, and uh, uh, Aristotle also talked about uh, the perils of automation. Um, so if you'd like to look at the um, the next, uh, just click once. Um, there's a, a quote from Aristotle. Uh, 
if every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, if in like manner the shuttle would weave and the plectrum touch the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants nor masters slaves. So uh, here, there he is in 350 BC talking about technological unemployment uh, as a result of artificial intelligence. Um, okay, next. Uh, so um, in mathematics, there was uh, a lot of work in um, both in the ancient Greek period and um, in the early Renaissance and then through the 19th century on formalizing logic as, as a mathematical model of correct reasoning. Uh, probability theory got going, got going in the 17th century um, and uh, more recently, uh, well, I say more recently, uh, late 17th century, uh, Isaac Newton and others developed um, some of the first methods for optimization of functions, and uh, and that's the basis for machine learning algorithms today. Uh, neuroscientists, sorry, good, if we can go back, uh, neuroscientists studied um, the brain, and uh, in the late 19th century, uh, figured out that it was made of neurons. Um, and, uh, and that those neurons could adapt uh, in response to stimuli. And so that led um, by the 1940s to computational models of neural systems, um, which are probably the most direct predecessors of deep learning methods from today. Uh, and economics ha had a, uh, an enormous role to play because it, it's uh, it studied uh, the whole notion of rational decisions. Uh, I think the concept of utility from Bernoulli and others is extremely important. Um, and we'll see that uh, the way we've thought about uh, intelligence in AI since the beginning is based in part on this notion of uh, a rational agent. Um, so in 1842, um, Babbage designed a universal machine and uh, Ada Lovelace, who worked with Babbage, actually wrote that, um, that such a machine uh, could be, if appropriately programmed, could be a, a, a thinking machine for all subjects in the universe. Um, so that's a pretty similar idea to what you might see in the late 1940s or 1950 from um, people like Alan Turing, um, except that it was 100 years earlier. The problem that uh, Babbage and Lovelace faced was that they couldn't build their universal machine. Uh, and had they built it, it probably would have run um, a lot slower than uh, the computers we have today. Uh, it would have been made of brass with cog wheels and uh, crankshafts and so on. And um, uh, we, it might still be running today trying to calculate uh, something very simple. So uh, if we go to the next slide, um, the, the official birth of AI was a workshop held in uh, Dartmouth um, in New Hampshire in 1956. And um, it was a proposal from four people, including the two on the left, John McCarthy, who was a, uh, an untenured uh, mathematician at, uh, I think at MIT at the time, and Claude Shannon, uh, who was already a very uh, well-established uh, theoretician who had developed um, information theory and had actually proposed the idea that computers should work with um, binary arithmetic zeros and ones uh, as well. So um, that workshop proposal basically brought together almost all the people who were thinking about making these newfangled computing devices intelligent. Um, they had several demonstrations of successful programs, including um, chess programs and uh, programs that could prove theorems in geometry 
and so on. But they were incredibly optimistic about progress. Um, so they thought that if if these men, as they call them, uh, could get together for a summer, uh, they'd be able to make significant progress on a whole range of problems um, that they listed. Uh, so it took a bit longer than that. Uh, and of course, we're still working on it. Next slide. Uh, so if we just step through this, um, the uh, as I mentioned, the, the first computational models of uh, intelligence were actually based on, uh, on neural networks. So a famous paper by McCulloch and Pitts, 1943, um, uh, sim simplified, uh, obviously, what real neurons do down to um, uh, a model in which each neuron is either on or off, so they're um, uh, strictly binary, um, but they're on or off depending on uh, their neighboring neurons and what signals those neighboring neurons are sending, and whether a weighted combination of those neighboring signals uh, exceeds some threshold, uh, in which case the neuron uh, turns on. And they showed that this was capable of a wide range of computations. Um, and that was really the basis for artificial neural networks and deep learning for today. Uh, and 1950, uh, Turing's paper on computing machinery and intelligence was, I would say, really the um, sort of the starting pistol for the field of AI, even though it wasn't called AI at that time. Uh, the paper uh, sets out many of the areas of AI that we are familiar with today. It even proposes that the easiest way to build AI systems uh, is to train uh, to train a blank slate on lots of data um, rather than try to program uh, everything into it. Um, so the first 20 years, uh, sometimes called the look ma no hands era. So this is like a, a child who's just learning to ride a bicycle and, and showing off that they can do it with no hands. Um, and, uh, and this is because there was not that much theory uh, of what was going on. And uh, what, a lot of what was done was take some aspect of intelligence, like playing chess or solving mathematical problems or translating from one language into another or passing an IQ test. And then um, you'd simply write a program that did that thing and then you demonstrated that the program did it uh, without any theory uh, as to what was you know what was really going on what type of problem solving what type of reasoning how general was your approach none of those things mattered it was more the ability to show that you could actually do it but there were some really important steps even in that period so the um, uh, the checkers program of Arthur Samuel, which was demonstrated on television in 1957, um, used reinforcement learning. And it was the uh, exact predecessor of uh, AlphaGo, which um, 60 years later uh, defeated the human world champion at Go. But it's essentially the same program, uh, just that AlphaGo was using a million, million, million times more computation, so 10 to the 18 times as much computation uh, as uh, Arthur Samuel's checker playing program. Um, so most people would say, you know, Go is more difficult, but it's not 10 to the 18 times more difficult than checkers. It's maybe three times more difficult. Uh, and so um, that was an amazing achievement uh, for the 1950s. Um, another important thing, uh, 1965, uh, Robinson, developed the resolution algorithm, which is a complete algorithm for reasoning in first order logic. So what does that mean? It means that the so first order logic is, is a mathematical uh, framework in which pretty much all uh, definite statements can be expressed, uh, including almost all the mathematics, um, but lots of other stuff about common sense or tax law or, uh, you know, uh, any, anything that we can write down in a definite form. And the algorithm is able to answer any question 
uh, with respect to any uh, set of um, facts or uh, rules that can be written in first order logic. So already by 1965, that was a, uh, a step towards a complete general purpose artificial intelligence. Uh, so in the 70s, there was uh, uh, the beginning of what we call expert systems, so systems that did reasoning using often somewhat restricted forms of, uh, of Robinson's algorithm um, and uh, large amounts of knowledge to solve important problems that industry cared about. And this led to a boom, not unlike the boom we're experiencing today, um, with the exception that instead of producing AI systems by training on lots of data, as is common now, uh, they were produced by you know, interviewing experts and writing down what those experts knew uh, in some uh, formalism, and then the AI system would reason with that knowledge to solve problems. Uh, there was a huge amount of excitement, loads of startup companies, lots of investment, um, but the technology was not really uh, robust or general enough to support the level of investment. Uh, and so it collapsed very, very quickly. Uh, once people start saying, you know, we're spending all this money and we're not getting a lot of return, uh, then all of a sudden everyone runs for the exit, not wanting to be the last person holding the baby, so to speak. And, uh, and, and it collapsed within less than a year, I would say, that, that bubble burst. And then um, in the last 30 years or so, uh, there's been much more focus on learning as a method of constructing AI systems, uh, much more technical depth. So I would say in many areas, work in AI uh, has uh, you know, exceeded some of its predecessor disciplines, such as statistics um, and operations research. Uh, and uh, I dare to say even some work in game theory uh, is, is pretty interesting. So next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the last part, uh, just that last um, bullet point. So as we're all aware, we're now back in the area, in the era of of deep learning, and to some extent, we have lost uh, touch with all of the theoretical foundations that we developed. Uh, and we're back in this period where we just build big systems, uh, and then we try them out and see what they do, and we say, wow, look at that, isn't that amazing? So it's very important to understand that um, the large language models like ChatGPT that many of you are familiar with, are um, completely mysterious even to their creators. So we have no idea what's going on. We have no idea what they're capable of, uh, what they're not capable of, why they take so long to learn some things, but learn other things very quickly um, and, and say very stupid things uh, on, on occasion. Um, and nonetheless, they are finding many applications both in uh, industry and commerce, but also um, in the sciences, and I think that the scientific applications may be uh, the most lasting contribution from this period. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is another slide from the undergraduate course, and it explains that the way we think about AI um, is as uh, designing agents. So agents, I think it's a somewhat similar word in economics, um, but it, it doesn't have the connotation that the agent is working for somebody. Uh, this is just uh, something that perceives and acts by itself. So the diagram on the bottom right uh, is, is the basic concept that you have an agent operating connected by sensors and actuators to an environment. Um, and then uh, that, that loop operates um, to, to uh, generate behavior. And so in the course, we use Pac-Man, uh, the video game, as uh, a running example to illustrate lots of different concepts. Um, and so uh, what we want is not just any old agent, but we want the rational agent. Um, and so that's uh, an agent that maximizes its, its uh, expected utility. And there are, there's a lot of caveats to that statement. Um, so maximizing is computationally intractable. So it, in general, 
uh, real agents are not going to be perfectly rational. Um, it uh, is a question, uh, where does it get its utility function from? And uh, in some AI methods, we implant it directly uh, by specifying uh, a reward function, for example, which is an ad a temporally additive utility function, um, or a logical goal, uh, as you might see in your uh, GPS navigation system where you specify the destination. Um, in other cases, it might be implicit, as we'll see later on with large language models. Um, and it's important to understand that um, within that general framework, there are many different types of agents. Um, and, and to a large extent, the type of agent that you build uh, depends on how it's going to be connected to its environment and the properties um, of that environment. So we, if we continue, um, we'll, the, the main thing we're teaching in this course is what are those different kinds of environments and ways of connecting the agent to the environment and how do they dictate the appropriate um, AI method that can be used.